It'll be okay. It's so warm in this room, it's not going to be okay. <laughs> back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And today we're discussing chapter 18, Assassinations. And it begins with uh, an overview of Chade's study on the Forged Ones, and his study in particular on um, trying to change one Forged One, Netta, back to a human state. Yes. Um, we kind of had a an inkling that this was coming up because a uh, a listener messaged us and said that that's where they thought that Shade went mm-hmm. um, when he was missing. I don't know. This was a few chapters back, mm-hmm. but in here it says that it's pretty much in between Galen having fits and now a couple months later. So I think Shade was just kind of gone. We still don't really know what he was doing for those couple months. Yeah, because this says it was 17 days after Springfest, and right. Galen's test happens in the middle of Springfest. So. Yep, and the previous conversation that we were having was where um, Birk was gone for a while, and Chade was gone, so Fitz yes. kind of had the run of the mill, and he was going out and, mm-hmm. and met it's when, patience. <laughs> yes, and it's when the forgings had just started. Um, so that's why we thought this might have fallen then, but yep. it doesn't look that way now. Yeah, so he must have, I don't know, Jade was doing mysterious Jade things back then. True. But, um, yeah, this is, she was forged um, at 14 years old. She came into possess, into Jade's possession six months after her forging. So she's been a forged one for a while. Um, she's ragged and everything. He kind of makes her feel like a human and treats her as if he would a wild animal to get her accustomed to... Um, his being there in his presence and giving her food, treating her nicely, grooming her, that sort of thing. It doesn't seem to help. No. Um, quick question. So since she's in his possession six months later, is this in the future then from what we're reading? She's taken alive from her village the 17th day after Springfest and She came into my possession some six months after her forging. Okay, so this is, like, after the whole thing at the Mountain Kingdom happens. Yeah. Right? Or is this from the first Springfest when things started? Possibly. I don't know. It's hard to tell because it just says after Springfest, which would be after the test, which means this chapter would have happened... While she's being forged, but not while she she's in possession of or but Shade is was, in possession of her. If it was the year before, I I can't recall off the top of my head. But was everything still? Um, were the forging still happen like happening at the intensity that they were? Because at the end of this passage it says there were at the time over 1,000 souls known to have been forged. That's a lot of people along the coast. Yeah. I guess the previous summer, if that's the first summer forging has happened, there were only four instances of forging. Yeah, and I I feel like that's that's four towns full of people. Yeah, but it wasn't towns full. Remember, like, one, one of the towns, like... That's true. So I guess this is future yeah. knowledge, technically. So this is technically in the future, yeah. Because like, one of them had people to take care of them and try to make them human again, and the other town had people pay the ransom to kill them. So mm-hmm. there were still people left in the towns when these people were taken to be forged. Right. So I still don't think... Like, I guess it depends. <laughs> so, yeah. We don't know the makeup of how many people are in these towns. Right. We don't know right. how big... I mean, the town that... Fitz is currently in is pretty big, but it's also basically the capital, and those are usually bigger anyway, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm not really sure. It's kind of, um, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting thing, because Robin Hobb never is specific about times. Right. <laughs> or, like, when an event happens in a mm-hmm. timeline. 
She did drop the year of our Lord once, and then... <laughs> Not even. It was, wasn't it 17 years after Shrewd started ruling or uh-huh, something? Yeah, and it wasn't the year even... of our Lord. <laughs> 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 so yeah, no, time is really iffy in this book. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about what he finds, because basically he can't figure out anything that's wrong or that will help her. Um, she is very greedy and will follow instructions and everything if she's hungry, but as soon as she gets food, she ignores everything. She has no care for herself like even an animal would. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's not sure whether something had been added to her or taken away to forge her. And we know it's taken away. Yes. But, Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, the purpose of all this is for Shade... Um, he wants to know how the thing is done so that he can reverse engineer it right. to how to undo it. Um, and so that's his main focus is just, and also, I mean, whenever there's a mystery happening, you have to throw everything at it to hope it, that you find a cure. So, right. <laughs> And um, he notes that She remembers her childhood, like Mm -hmm. her up to her 14 years until she was raided and forged. Mm -hmm. And then everything is kind of like a long yesterday. And we know from future books that when Riddle is forged briefly and then he becomes unforged, he remembers everything that has happened while he was forged. Right. Um, And he remembers his feelings and his thoughts and has PTSD and, and... some terrible memories and dreams from that time. Yeah. But at the time, I guess, like, they just don't care about those memories or to form those long-lasting, you know, Mm -hmm. connections in their brain. Yeah, it's like their humanity is turned off. Yep. Um, Yeah, but I mean, I think the weirdest thing that they um, tell us is that the forged people don't do anything besides eat and sleep. And yeah. go to the bathroom. So I think that's just like a weird thing where they like literally do nothing. They like it's kind of like I don't know, almost like depression, but they don't have any feelings at all. So it can't be that. But they just like literally sit around and do nothing until it's time to do something. The only time they attack is whenever they're being territorial. And I just think it's really interesting the dynamics that we're learning about how forge people acts. Yeah, act in this. Well, then it kind of jumps back into Fitz's story where um, Beric had meant what he said at the end of the last chapter, and he wants nothing to do with Fitz anymore. Fitz isn't allowed in the stables. He can't settle his own horse. Cobb takes pleasure in that, of course, because he's... A jerk. A jerk. Yep. (laughs) Um, Even Sudi, he feels like he's been abandoned by Sudi because... She is fine with Cobb saddling and feeding her and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So Fitz is pretty beside himself at the moment and very upset. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze through some of these things because it's it's a lot of the same as the end of last chapter. Stop me if you need to mention anything. Do you want to say that it kind of explains in here why he's not doing anything? Um, yeah. Because Fitz isn't doing anything. He's basically just wandering around and wasting time. Says he has a ton of time on his hands. Yeah. You know. I mean, he used to spend the mornings with Burek and obviously can't do that anymore. So. <laughs> right, right. Um, but not only that, he can't even go to town because he's embarrassed about the whole Jade and Molly thing and mm-hmm. his pride is hurt. And then also his friends, Carrie and Dirk, have apprenticeships and are gone. So is Fedrin. And... Mm-hmm. I mean, we know from last chapter he was kind of a jerk to patients, so he can't exactly go spend time with her. <laughs> and he's like, I could not think of a way to apologize to her. And mm-hmm. I did not even think about Molly. <laughs> yep. So, and then he describes it as a summer of misery. Yep. And it's just sad. I mean, I can't imagine your whole life getting turned upside down like that. Ugh, that'd just be really hard. <laughs> Although, he did kind of bring some of it on himself, but... Oh, yeah. I mean, he's not in the right frame of mind, either. Right. Um, But he 
takes up drinking as a habit. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, as like an actual habit now. Mm-hmm. He says a few times a week at least, um, at the very least. But uh, the summer is very bad for the six duchies as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the raids are picking up, and they're devastating the coasts. And they are demanding um, a bunch of different things, like their pick of slaves, grains, and cattle, and of course the king has to refuse everything. Right. But, I mean, there's more forgings because of that, because right. that's their demand. Like, there'll be mm-hmm. more forgings, or you give us all this stuff. Which make the people trust the king less, mm-hmm. and everybody's leaving. They're all leaving town because they're afraid of getting forged. The coastal with, towns, yeah. Yeah, which leaves the coasts more open to attack because nobody's there to watch stop or, yeah. them. <laughs> and nobody's making a living, so the taxes are going up to pay for the soldiers that aren't doing their job, basically. Well, they're trying to do their job, but they're not performing well because the red ship raiders seem to slip in anyway and they don't have actual warships they so their merchant warships. ships are slow and can't mm-hmm. catch the raiders so everybody's now having to pay extra taxes on top of leaving their livelihoods for fear of their lives and this is not not a good time no <laughs> uh he does say even stranger were the out islanders who came to our shore in their family ships their raiding vessels left behind to beg asylum of our people and to tell wild tales of chaos and tyranny in the out islands where the red ships now ruled completely. And uh, that just kind of points to that there is a huge division between the out islanders and the red ships. But of Mm -hmm. course, like after this war is complete, there is still mistrust of all out islanders. Right. And that whole people, because one faction waged war and even if some of the people were oppressed as well everyone is just kind of like stereotyping yeah. the red ships as everybody um, and I did note that this paragraph or part of the paragraph here points to how many skilled people respond to Nettle's call as skill master in future trilogies because this is about I don't know 15 years before the next trilogy starts right. enough for the out islanders to mix bloodlines, have families, and mix with the six duchies people oh, to create more skill bloodlines. That's a good And when catch. they send the call out, a lot more people can answer. Nice catch. Yeah. I'm wondering if this is where, when Thick was conceived as well. I don't know how old he is. I don't know either. But sometime between now and like five, six years or something like that. Huh. Actually, this is... I mean, he's 14, so there's 20 years before the start of the Tawny Man right now, which is enough time for some of the people who fled over to actually Settle assimilate. Down. Yeah. Yeah. And so make 20 families. years later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I'm wondering where some of... If that's, like, where some of the strong skill bloodlines start popping up again. Yeah. And why there's so many. Because it does say that there are a lot. Yeah. Like, Nettle's constantly training. Mm-hmm. Um, people, I mean, throughout the rest of the series, when she becomes skill mi- a mistress, she is constantly training new groups, and it like seems like there's an excess almost. But I, I didn't even think about that. I just thought it's because they're finally allowing regular people to be allowed. But... I think it's both. Like I think they yeah. suppressed it so long that there were a ton of people, but with a constant Incoming, influx yeah. of you the know islanders refugees. mixing with yeah yeah. Oh, that's so good. Okay. And then it happens again when um, Dutiful becomes king and they um, he marries the Narcheska, mm-hmm. Eliana, and they mix peoples again. Like Right. Right. So it's just constant, constantly, cool. inadvertently breeding more skill users. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, after it says after a month of Fitz's return... Of his drinking and everything, Chade finally opens his doors again. Mm -hmm. And he is extremely tired, weary. He's been dealing with all of this and trying to find ways to help the kingdom. He's been the counsel to the king Mm -hmm. and helping Verity live. (laughs) Yeah. And Fitz is just a little dick about everything. Yeah. He's... 
He's very moody. Yep. Definitely got the teenage boy vibe, you know, teenager in general vibe. (laughs) Jade kind of puts out, you know, not a complete apology, but an olive branch is, I'm sorry, I thought perhaps you would need time alone to recover yourself. It has not been an easy winter and spring for me, either. Shall we try to put the time behind us and go on? It was a gentle and reasonable suggestion. I knew it was wise. Have I any choice? I asked sarcastically. (laughs) He just continues to reply like that and Mm -hmm. gets mean and everything. And um, Chade is just finally like, Okay, you will stop drinking anything but water or tea for the rest of the summer. Your sweat stinks of wine, and for one so young, your muscles are lax. A winter of Galen's meditations has done your body no good at all. See that you exercise it. Take it upon yourself, as of today, to climb to Verity's tower four times a day. You will take him food, and the teas I will show you, how to prepare. You will never show him a sullen face, but will always be cheerful and friendly. Perhaps a while of waiting on Verity will convince you that I have had reasons for my attention not being centered on you. Yeah, but it had not taken many words from Shade to awaken shame in myself. I have been idle, I admitted. You have been stupid, Shade agreed. <laughs> and then Shade points out Fitz's biggest flaw. Yeah. You had a month in which to take charge of your own life. You behaved like a spoiled brat. <laughs> I have no wonder that Burek is disgusted with you. And of course, Jay doesn't know the full reasons for that. No. But he had a full month in which he could have done anything. He had Mm -hmm. no responsibilities. He could have picked up a new talent. He could have been getting back into the keep to see what he had missed. He could have been doing anything. And instead, he just moped around and felt sorry for himself. And I kind of feel like this is a problem that he always has. He has no direction no. without being told. He needs... Takes after Verity a little too much. <laughs> That's true. He always whines about not having any choices and not and always having to do what other people want him to do and talks about how he doesn't want to be certain things, but then takes no action to actively work against being those things. Right. Or take any actions to better himself in another way, to open doors, <laughs> to change his uh, his situation. But... Come on, Fitz, we love you, but you're, <laughs> you're terrible at this. <laughs> He's 14. Okay. True. He just lost his best friend. Yes. And his father figure. Mm-hmm. So... And that's very hard, and he deserves yeah. time to be mopey. I'm just saying, this is a common theme mm-hmm. that comes back yes. over... This isn't the only time. Oh, no, no, and no. And it's... I don't know. I mean, everybody should have grieving periods, and everybody grieves differently, but... You can't complain about your life not being what you want it to be if every time you're given an opportunity, you just waste it. (laughs) True. Um, And then Jade offers up the idea of what Fitz pretty much should have been doing the whole time, and he kind of admits to himself. Yep. Have you discovered yet who tried to kill him? I haven't tried, really. (laughs) Now Jade looked disgusted and then puzzled. Boy, you are not yourself at all. Six months ago, you would have torn the stables apart to know such a secret. Six months ago, given a month's holiday, you would have filled each day. What troubles you? And Fitz doesn't really know. He kind of deflects and tells and fills in Chade everything that he knows of Burek's attack. Mm-hmm. Um, well, almost everything. Almost everything. Well, yeah. He's... He can't say that he was looking through a dog's eyes to find the... And he can smell the person who did it, but not describe him. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but Chade kind of, again, like, with the same death of chivalry pushing, he's like hinting that it was not a personal quarrel of Burex and that it was, you know, part of a gambit. It was targeted. It was part of an actual plot. Mm -hmm. And Fitz, of course, still wants this to be Galen, and we know it is Galen, Mm -hmm. but... Do you think uh, Chade knows in this moment who did it, or do you think he just, like, kind of assumes that he's right and who it is? The way that we see Fitz's mind operates, I think 
He has a strong suspicion or a couple suspicions, but will never act on it because one, he doesn't have 100% proof. That's not the way that he's supposed to operate. And two, the king is not telling him to act. Fair. So he won't. Yeah. Also, Jade says something pretty interesting um, about this whole thing because he's pushing Fitz to look more into this, to yeah. use his brain. <laughs> and Fitz, you know, is very confused. He's like, well, why don't you just tell me what you think? Because you obviously have some thoughts going on. And Jade says, I could, but I will not. I want to leave your mind free to find its own assumptions, independent of mine. And I find that so interesting because this is really how Jade works. He is so knowledgeable and he knows so many things, but he wants other people to be able to come to conclusions. He knows he has a bias. He's an incredibly intelligent man. Yes. But he knows that he can be susceptible to, you know, preconceived notions Mm -hmm. of anything. And if he pushes Fitz to pursue this and he finds the same things, then that's less of his bias pointing towards the answer Mm -hmm. and potentially a real answer. But I think it's interesting that he always has this kind of, like, neutrality about him to try and get the most information he can, but that he also is discouraged whenever Fitz doesn't turn out more like him, which only could have happened if he would have been less neutral about certain things, I think. (laughs) I think it's just an interesting personality trait of his. Yeah. Um, And then Chade shows Fitz how to make the tease for Verity, and Fitz is kind of horrified at the strength of the tease and what's going in them. Um, We know it's mainly like elf bark, things like that, to keep his energy up. Um, And there was like you know, a little bit of talk in his head about how the common folk um, thought Regal was fine becoming more and more opulent in his travels to, you know, find a bride for Verity because, Mm -hmm. you know, they haven't seen Verity very often and Regal is just traveling around and he's the only visible one. But... um, Fitz is, like, remarking, like, yeah, I haven't seen much of Verity, but Regal's about. Did you notice in this, when he says he hasn't seen much of Verity, it's not just Verity, of my Verity. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I had seen little of my Verity. And then it's just Regal. Yeah. But Regal was about. And I just find it really interesting that he has a sort of possessive nature um, towards It's also, like, my king kind of thing. Right. But it just, I don't know, I thought that was a nice little, subtle touch in there. That is really nice, because later in the chapter, uh, Fitz realizes that he does want to help Verity in any way, and he would be proud to serve him Mm -hmm. as a vassal when Verity is king. So I think that, like, subconsciously, those little hints kind of lean us and make it not surprising for us. Right. And just kind of give evidence that that's happening in Fitz's mind. Good catch. Um, But yeah, uh, he hasn't seen much of Verity, and when he has, he's been looking harassed and worn. And uh, Verity seems almost stunned, impassive and distracted. He had noticed me only once, and then smiled wearily, said I had grown. That That had been the extent of our conversation. But I had noticed that he ate like an invalid, without appetite, eschewing meat and bread as if they were too great of an effort to chew and swallow, and instead subsisting on porridges and soups. And Chade's like, Shrewd tells me he uses skill too much, but I really don't know anything about it, and I don't know why it should drain him or, you know, make him lose weight mm-hmm. um, or, or anything like that. We try to make him rest, but he says he dares not because he's pretty much protecting the coast as best as he can. Right. And all of his effort is preventing a much greater raiding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this brings up the question, what about Galen's coterie? This is what they were trained for. Yeah. Why aren't they helping? And Chade is, you know, sighs and explains that he's using them the way normal people would use carrier pigeons. And 
that they're sent to the towers um, and uses them to convey warnings to his soldiers. But the task of defending the coast, he trusts to no one else. Others, he tells me, would be too inexperienced. They might betray themselves to those they skilled. And this is really interesting because on the one hand, this could partially be because he is addicted to skilling and doesn't want to share any of that skilling with others. But on the other hand, this is also probably partially the fact that Galen isn't a very good skill master and didn't train these people the way he should have. And so they're useless. Basically they're nothing more than carrier pigeons, basically, which is sad because all those kids spent, that long kids some of them are in their 20s but you know (laughs) all those people spent months being harassed by galen and indoctrinated into this horrible cult that is terrible only to come out with basically no skills yeah and they all obviously have some sort of aptitude towards this skill that they could have learned but if we had a real skill master it would actually yeah maybe saved the six duchies with just one coterie. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fitz takes that as a rebuke because Verity has no one to trust that can spell him or give him strength. And Verity er, and Fitz is like, "Well, I failed, so I'll take that as rebuke and mm-hmm. be quiet." Um, but I did want to note as we continue on in this meeting that. Fitz kind of wanders over to Chade's desk and he has, you know, he always has some sort of scrolls out or books or something. And it says, this crop seemed to deal mostly with elderlings. I wandered about intrigued by the colored illustrations. One tablet, older and more elaborate than the rest, depicted an elderling as a sort of gilded bird with a man-like head crowned with quillish hair. (laughs) And that is our best depiction that they have of an actual elderling. Right. Um, Man-like head, crowned with quillish hair. Obviously, it was an actual elderling changed uh, by a dragon into some view that the dragon thought was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, The gilded bird is obviously, like, they're they're colorful. They have Mm -hmm. more bird-like tendencies because their bones are elongated. Right. Um, Maybe the start of some wings or something like that. Because we do know that they can get wings because of Timera later. Yeah. Although, I feel like the dragons comment that that is not normal. Right. Too. So, I don't know. Well, I was wondering if this was more, less of like an exact depiction. Oh, it's definitely not exact. Yeah. And more of like trying to convey an idea on paper of something you don't know a ton about. Yeah. Um, and maybe like the bird like is actually a dragon's body. Yeah. Um, to convey that these people are the spokesmen, their heads are normal human heads. So they're the spokesmen of the dragons because that's basically what elderlings are. And so I thought that maybe this was just a, uh, I don't know what that's called. Uh, symbol (laughs) symbolism. (laughs) It could be, like, a, a concept sketch, too, because you know how uh, in, like, medieval times or whatever, artists would draw animals off of descriptions only, and you'd find oh, yeah. some really messed up looking stuff? Like those cats that, like, have human faces? <laughs> yeah, things like, things like that. Right. And okay. I feel like this could be one of those things where, like, oh, yeah, we met these winged creatures that were really glittery they had like spikes all around their heads and stuff but they spoke to us and the person's like the only people who can speak are humans so it has to have like a human head so you think these are them talking about dragons yeah it might be okay okay that's a good i like that too (laughs) that's a funny thought that they just somebody was trying to describe a dragon and then this (laughs) the artist was just they're like no 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 i got it don't even don't say no more i know exactly what a dragon looks like (laughs) (laughs) we also get a uh an actual language name for chalced uh peach or piche um the ancient native tongue and it says the southernmost duchy it's not actual part of the six duchies but it is a duchy of its own Mm -hmm. which like 
on this reread kind of confused me because I fixated on the word duchy and I'm like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Jade is is pretty sad and apologetic, but also not actually apologizing for anything here. Right. But he says, it was not easy for me, but I kept my word. Galen demanded complete control of his students. And as I told you, in the Queen's Garden, I am blind and without influence. And in a few, in a little, a little bit, um, like at the, I think at the end of this chapter, we find out that Verity has submitted like an official complaint about Galen, about the way uh, he's treated Fitz. Um, Jade doesn't know that yet, so he actually doesn't know what, like what's going on, but he kind of Mm-hmm. Feels like Fitz went through something terrible. Well, he knows what Burek did. Yeah, and he, knows he also did. knows Burek enough to know that he's not just gonna beat up Galen for no reason. <laughs> right, yeah. So he's like it's it's you know he says, I, I did not disagree with Burek's actions. Only my word to my king kept me from contacting you. It has been a difficult time, I know. I wish I could have helped you. And you should not feel too badly that you Failed, I filled in the word, while he was searched for a gentler one. I sighed and suddenly admitted my pain. Let's leave it, Shade. I can't change it. Um, and Shade takes this as, like, let's, you know, yeah. great, we addressed it. Yeah. Uh, let's use your knowledge that you did get. Uh-huh. Try to use it to our advantage. Well, because what if, you know, what if you just mono e mono <laughs> talk to me, me and tell me <laughs> tell me what you learned and maybe we can find something useful in that um but like che is literally in the dark about this because the skill scrolls are nowhere to be found at this point mm-hmm. i mean they're all lock lock and key by held by galen mm-hmm. um but fitz is adamant that he cannot tell him anything because he doesn't know he doesn't know how to skill it's not for bastards to know yeah that's the worst part i think yeah is when he says leave it it is not for bastards to know i think i've proved that yeah and i feel like that's such a harsh blow to jade because i mean he's basically reprimanding him and jade's a bastard too so Mm -hmm. That, oh, that would have to hurt coming from your grandson. No, the great nephew. Great nephew. Yeah, because yep. Yeah, so I would just oh, that would hurt so bad. Yeah, especially because he's probably heard that his whole life. Like this isn't for bastards. And but now... he can also like it doesn't. It hurts him because of that's like an old pain. I'm sure like mm-hmm. bastards aren't allowed to learn anything, but it's not directed at Fitz because he's also experiencing that, and I think I he guess. can empathize. I just felt like it was unnecessarily rude to Jade. I mean, it it is. Fitz has been <laughs> very unnecessarily rude the past months. Yeah. True. Um, but this is where Jade says, "I've been looking into forging as well over these last few months," which is another weird time thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, because it's been like a month since Spring Fest, according to the beginning of the chapter. Yep. And we know that the forging, like the girl that he was trying to help, was six months after Spring well, Fest. And here's the other weird thing is that Fitz says it was a lonely summer. That's true. At the beginning. And Spring Fest is, correct me if I'm wrong, at the beginning of spring to That's celebrate the It could have actually coming. been a few, yeah. So, but Chade specifically says it's been one month since they met. Yeah. Which would mean that summer hasn't even started, so unless Fitz is saying it's about to be a long, lonely summer. But I don't, it's just a weird time. This chapter is a little full full of... Like, incongruities with the time and (laughs) and where to fit things together. Or at least it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And maybe it made sense to, you know... I, you know, when I read these, I just kind of, like, fill it in in, like, half a year chunks. I'm like, oh, this happened about here. Great. (laughs) This happened about here. Perfect. It's summer or, like, sun is out time. Good. This is winter time. Good. (laughs) Like, that's about how I... I get very caught up with the descriptions of, like, what the outside is like and when. And sometimes it doesn't add up and I get very confused, but I let it slide. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but he says pretty much what we found out at the beginning of this chapter, 
Um, the only cure I found for it is the oldest one known to work on anything. Mm-hmm. I rolled and fastened the scroll I had been looking at, feeling I knew what was coming. I was not mistaken. The king has charged me with an assignment for you. That summer, over three months, I killed seventeen times for the king. Had I not already killed, out of my own volition and defense, it might have been harder. He he goes out on seventeen different missions over three months to kill forged ones. Yep. And at first I thought that meant he only killed seventeen people. And that's not not true. He was killing large groups of them. Yeah, he's him, a horse, and panniers of bread, which is a large container or a basket that's often carried on the back of an animal. Mm-hmm. So, like, a ton of bread that's poisoned, yeah. and a horse. And Fitz just has to get up into the middle of Forged Ones and drop the bread and say, Hey, eat this! Here's, mm-hmm. here's food! And then run away. Right. Which is also a little scary because, I mean, hopefully he's doing this in places where people have abandoned and it's not well traveled by normal people but like what if a beggar kid or person came up and found this like free bread on the ground yeah, which means he actually it, has like, to find the backs of yeah forged ones. so that's like the word i don't know yeah. that would be really and it's scary for him because he can't feel these creatures these it, forged yeah. people it describes how terrified he is like perhaps if i had been an ordinary man at arms i would have been less frightened But all of my life I had been accustomed to relying on my wit to let me know when others were about. To me, it was tantamount to having to work without using my eyes. And he found out that not all of them had been, you know, just village folk. Some of them had been soldiers. He got uh, a nasty cut on his shoulder that he still has a scar from. Mm -hmm. Um, He was only able to get away from that by saying, the others are eating your bread, you shouldn't let them. And then the person attacking him left. Yeah. Like, it, this is, yeah, I don't know. This is a, a terrifying experience for a 14-year-old boy. Maybe 15, though? Yeah. Because I think his, what, what did we, you decide? Well, his... at first I thought his birthday was in the winter, but... We thought it was, like, winter, early, like, late winter, early spring, right? Yeah, but now I'm pretty sure we're talking midsummer-ish. Yeah. Just based off of timeline-wise. But he doesn't even know when his yeah, birthday is, Yeah, he doesn't is, know when so. his birthday is, so... Somewhere in there, but I'm pretty sure it's in summer, so he could be 15 at this point now. Yeah. He's turning 15. <laughs> I would, yeah, I would say late 14 or something, but like a grown man who's starved and wants to kill you and. Yeah. Definitely still going to be able to. Yeah. Attack a 15, 14 year old. Even if that 14 year old can use blunt wood to <laughs> kill a couple people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh,. Chade spreads a tale that they had probably died from eating spoiled fish because rumors of, like, these dead forged ones laying around are getting around um, because the poisons are pretty deadly. So mm-hmm. they eat something, and then they fall down dead, and it's probably not a pretty sight. There's probably convulsions and vomit and things like that. So they have to spread a tale of, like, don't... Like the classic wives' tale, oh, it's spoiled fish from spawning streams. Uh-huh. Which also is probably pretty easy for people to believe right. because they're probably just relieved that the forged ones aren't around to kill them anymore. Yeah, it's just a justification that they yeah. can use. It's something to easily grasp onto. Um, and so I became accustomed to killing and had nearly a score of deaths to my credit before I had to meet the eyes of a man and then kill him too. And this one, this guy is a real piece of garbage. And at the end of this, before we get, like, if you want to talk about the details, we can. But at the end of it, he says, To this day, I have no regrets for the deed or for the choice of slow death for him. He basically was just a piece of garbage who, um, he... Abused this... uh, A child servant. Yeah. Well, at first, it was because he, in a temper, struck the child of a servant and left the girl a whittling. Yep. And so King Shrewd said that the lordling had to pay the full blood debt. And um, that was fine. Yep, that was done. Yeah, he did it. he basically rendered her... 
not necessarily a vegetable because she could move and stuff, but her brain function was probably... Yeah, lowered. Well, yeah. she probably suffered from a traumatic brain injury, so... Yeah. So she wasn't the same afterwards. But, okay, I get confused. What is a blood debt if not life for a life? So um, he killed somebody else? Blood debt, they explain later as well, is pretty much you have to pay money to a family if they die. Oh, okay, okay. Because I was like, I don't understand. I think it's in a different book. I think okay. they're t- maybe in this, in the um, Tawny Man trilogy. I'm not sure. Mm. I just was thinking a blood debt would be like, you like you have to die or suffer mm. the same fate because you did it to somebody else, and that he just like killed a different servant and was like, there you go, <laughs> life for life, which is stupid because. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, No, he probably had to pay the person's family, like the servant. Okay, what she would have. Okay. Yeah. And so he did that, but then the girl who was injured, her cousin comes to court to say that um, she's being kept in a cage. And being abused. And being abused. um, And Fitz goes and checks it out, and and she's she's pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> he says it was not so difficult to poison him because he offered right. me wine and fine crystal and begged the latest news of the king's court at Buckkeep. Like, ugh, that's what's worse is he... He acts like it's fine. Yeah, he doesn't care that he's literally keeping a child at the foot of his... Kept like a dog at the foot of the lordling's chair. Yeah, like, ugh. It's just, uh, everything about it is gross, but yeah, so he's a horrible person, and Fitz does not feel bad. Yeah, he died in blood and madness and froth a month or so later. So. The cousin took in both girl and child. Yeah. So. So yeah. the very slow-acting poison that he used. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's then it moves on to him waiting on Prince Verity when he was not... You know, out killing forged ones, he's... Or that one guy. Or that one guy. He's uh, waiting on my lord, Prince Verity. First time he climbs up, there's no guard. He taps at the door, there's no answer, so he enters. And there's a nice summer wind. It would have been a very pleasant chamber full of light and air on a stuffy summer day. Instead, it seemed to me a cell. There was the chair by the window and a small table next to it. In the corners and around the edges of the room, and the floor was dusty and littered with bits of old strewing reeds. And Verity, chin slumped to his chest as if dozing, except that, to my senses, the room thrummed with his effort. His hair was unkempt, his chin bewhiskered with a day's growth, his clothing hung on him. So, is he sensing the use of skill with his wit, or with his skill? I think with his skill, I mean, like calls to like there, and I would say that, like, even if with his massive walls, he can feel that energy, same with, like, the the skill road later on. Right. Oh, and I guess he also sometimes felt the brushing of Galen on his senses. Yeah. So it if, comes and goes yeah. for him. And if somebody he trusts and his family is using skill near him. I mean, I don't think his guards are up like he's expecting to be attacked by Galen, so. But Verity is surprised to see Fitz. And um, Fitz is like, it's, I brought your food. And Verity's like, oh, I already ate um, some aw- awful fish soup early this morning. And Fitz is like, that was that was yesterday. So Verity's doing this pretty much nonstop. He's barely sleeping. Mm. He's barely eating. He's just skilling yep. out. And so with his breakfast, Fitz serves him elf bark tea. Yep. Very strong elf bark tea. Yeah. How strong is Verity's skill that he's been regularly drinking strong droughts of elf bark and is still able to control the red ships? Like he's incredibly strong. Yeah. And I guess it's later Shrewd says he's the strongest of the family. Of the that family. He's seen, yeah. But that's insane because Elfbark, am I wrong, deadens the skill in you? Yeah, I think it's. I, I, we'll have to wait until Kettle comes along because I think she explains a little bit more. Or maybe it's in the Scrolls in the Tawny Man trilogy. Mm-hmm. But it, I think it's more like a 
poison over a long period of time that deadens it. But it does like the. It I know, should be. Hungry. Yeah, it, it kind of cuts you off a little bit. I remember yeah. that. Well, because they, whenever later in the final series, whenever people are attacking, he takes Elf Bark to deaden himself yeah. to the skill, so he can see through the skill. Mm-hmm. To so, like Verity is just kind is of like. Ridic- think yeah. of how strong he would be without the Elf Bark, like. Well, and regular sleep. And regular sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's insane. At the end of this series, Verity probably doesn't sleep for, like, a year of the three years it takes. Because he's, like, working on his dragon nonstop. He's Uh doing this nonstop. Like, it's crazy. I mean, he probably falls asleep every once in a while, but not for very long. No, it's just exhaustion until he wakes up again, I bet. Yep. Um, Yeah, (laughs) it's kind of crazy. But uh, he's, like, casually mentioning Chade's name here. Like, Chade never relents, does he? As if Chade's name were mentioned every day about the keep. And Fitz is just kind of like, hey, you have, you have to eat if you want to keep at this. It says that he ate the food with no relish um, and then drank the tea in a manful draft as a medicine, undeceived by ginger or mint. And, he's, and Fitz is like, I had prepared that tea myself. That much elf bark would have had Sooty jumping over the stall walls. <laughs> so it was a, it's a hefty dose. Yep. Ugh. My prince, Verity, are you all right? Verity, he repeated as in a daze, yes. And I prefer that to sir or my prince or my lord. This is my father's gambit, to send you. Well, I may surprise him yet, but yes, call me Verity. And tell them I ate, obedient as ever, I ate. Go on now, boy, I have work to do. (laughs) And then, uh, as Fitz is leaving, uh, Verity's like, boy, sir? Uh Ah-ah, he warned me. (laughs) Verity? Leon is in my rooms, boy. Take him out for me, will you? He pines. There's no sense in that, both of us shriveling like this. Yes, sir, Verity. So now Fitz is taking care of the old uh, wolfhound, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, things pass, and um, as he's taking care of Leon and taking care of Verity, uh, he he makes a mention here that... um, As I discovered long ago, I could communicate with Leon, but there was no bond. He did not always heed me, nor even believe me all the time. Had he been but a pup, I am sure we could have bonded to one another. But he was old and his heart given forever to Verity. We, the wit was not dominion over beasts, but only a glimpse into their lives. And that sort of thinking is such a naive mistake on Fitz's part for the old blood. Like, according to the old blood. Like, if he was a pup, we could have bonded. Sure, but that's a bit predatory yeah like maybe it's just speaking on he had the presence of mind to be able to wit to wit bond with somebody else Mm -hmm. because we know some animals just don't have the capacity or are not interested in that right but um yeah if it's like just saying that had he been but a pup i'm sure we could have bonded to one another at that point if he was a pup fitz probably would have bonded him yep (laughs) well i wonder i read that as like if he had less time with Verity, he would have been easier to bond to. So he'd have to be a pup to, for that to work. But now that he has basically bonded himself one way to Verity, which is also interesting that animals can bond to humans without wit. Yeah, it's um, not necessarily like bonding, but it's yeah. It's not the same. But the fact that they can choose partners yeah, who they know loyalty. will never share... Um, the, you know, I don't know. I just find that really interesting. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it is a little, little bad. But Fitz is like, well, if it was a puppy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he describes, you know, trying to coax Verity to eat every day, um, and he says something here um, after the foray in which I took my knife wound. He watched me awkwardly load his empty dishes onto the tray. How they must laugh in their beards, as if they knew we slay our own. I froze, wondering what answer to make to that, for as far as I knew, my tasks were only known to shrewd and shade. But Verity's eyes had gone afar again, and I left silency, silently. Uh, we kind of know that Verity is pretty addicted to the skill at this point, mm-hmm. and he does fight against the Red Ship Raiders most of the time. But he also goes to villages 
he he oversees people around the six duchies and he must have been watching Fitz a couple times right to know of this yeah i was going to say do you think it's that he was watching him or do you think that shrewd runs his plans by verity it could be, but I feel like Shrewd is like, eh, he doesn't need to know and would just Fair. tell Chade and Chade would take care of it. He could, but I, I feel like Verity is once in a while just checking everything and Sees Fitz first popped accident. in, and then when Fitz left and he hasn't seen Fitz for a while, pops in on him. Fair. Right. Um, without intending to, I began to make changes around him. So he kind of sweeps up. He adds a little bit more comfort into it, more pillows, string reeds, some um, nice smelling things to make, to try to uh, make the headaches go away that Faraday always gets. Um, but it's it's nothing to overclutter because he needs that you know stark room to concentrate and to be open. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I find it funny that um, he brought up a cushion for Verity, which he ignored for several days, and then one day had arranged them to his liking. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if it was that he was ignoring it, or if he just truly did not even notice that it was there. Yeah, I think he just is so oblivious that, like, I mean, he, he can't pay attention to what day it is, or when he last ate, mm-hmm. so... Fitz goes up one time, and he finds Verity dozing in his chair. So he kind of sits by it, and then falls asleep himself. And Verity has this conversation with him. He starts, Do they tell you to watch over me so, boy, even when I sleep? What do they fear, then? Not that I know, Verity. They tell me only to bring you food, and see as best I can that you eat it. No more than that. And the blankets, and cushions, and pots of sweet flowers? My own doing, my prince. No man should live in such a desert as this. And in that moment, I realized we were not speaking aloud, and sat bolt upright and looked at him. Verity, too, seemed to come to himself. He shifted in his comfortless chair. I bless this storm that lets me rest. I hid it from three of their ships, persuading those who looked to the sky that it was no more than a summer squall. Now they ply their oars and peer through the rain, trying to keep their courses, and I can snatch a few moments of honest sleep. I ask your pardon, boy. Sometimes, now, the skilling seems more natural than speaking. I did not mean to intrude on you. No matter, my prince, I was but startled. I cannot skill myself, except weakly and erratically. I do not know how I open to you. Verity, boy, not your prince. No one's prince sits still in a sweaty shirt with two days of beard. But what is this nonsense? Surely it was arranged for you to learn the skill. I remember well how Patience tongue battered away my father's resolve. He permitted himself a weary smile. Galen tried to teach me, but I had not the aptitude. With bastards, I am told it is often, wait, he growled, and in an instant was within my mind. This is faster, he offered by way of apology, and then muttering to himself, what is this that clouds you so? Ah! and was gone again from my mind, and all as deft and easy as a beric taking a tick off a hound's ear. He sat long, quiet, and so did I, wondering. And then he says, I am strong in it, as was your father. Galen is not. <laughs> I was right. Galen is pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, you were right. I thought he must be stronger because of some of the things that he does and that he does have some farseer blood, not of the royal line, mm-hmm. but farseer blood. But I guess he's just doesn't have the right mix. Right. And I mean, to be fair, Verity is like very strong. insanely strong. Yeah. So in comparison, a regular skill user probably is pretty weak. <laughs> but, but I'm going to take this to mean that I was right, that and Galen, Galen was nothing. <laughs> Galen has barely any power. <laughs> um, but that whole part where Fitz is open to the skill, he can skill well, he can communicate, and he's convinced that, like, no, I don't have any skill, and Verity's like... You just used it. <laughs> yeah, you just use it. No way. Like, you, you do. <laughs> Let me check your mind real quick, do which you think... is kind of invasive as well. Yes, but, but do you think 
when he says that I don't have any skill, Galen tried to teach me, but I had not the aptitude. Um, this is when he notices immediately something's wrong and then goes into Fitz's brain. Do you think he's already kind of in there anyway, and that's how he notices? Or do you think it's just the way he's talking? I think, like, they kind of, um, depict later on that when you are talking with somebody and skill connected and talking to them, you can tell, like, kind of that they have aptitude or if they have a skill or whatever. And I think Verity, like, with how you know, easy that communication was, Mm -hmm. I feel like Verity was able to be like, no, that's, that's malarkey. Like, come on. Also, Galen tried to teach you. I've seen what he's done to the coterie. (laughs) (laughs) True. Um, but Verity skirts kind of around delicate subject because Fitz is like, how would he become skill master then if he's not strong? And he (laughs) says, Galen was Queen Desire's pet, a favorite. The queen emphatically suggested Galen as apprentice to Solicity. Often I think our old skill master was desperate when she took him as apprentice. Solicity knew she was dying, you see. I believe she acted in haste and toward the end regretted her decision. And I do not think he had half the training he should have had before becoming, quote, master. But there he is. He is what we have. Which is all true. He pretty much has the right of it there, as far as we know. And then he yeah. elaborates by saying, um, Galen was given that place as a plum, not because he merited it. And I think that's just a really good reminder that yeah. sometimes people don't get where they're, they've they gotten to because of their ability. It's because of... Nepotism. Some, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Someone they know. So... But uh, he has a really good description of what coteries are actually for Mm -hmm. and how Galen does not grasp that and did not understand or didn't care to understand. And he didn't have an understanding of what the skill master was. I know we've talked about the duties of the skill master and um, why they have so much power over the king or decisions about this. And here we get a straight answer. Um, Solicity was more than someone who swaggered about secure in a high position. She was advisor to Bounty, and a link between the king and all who skilled for him. She made it her business to seek out and teach as many as manifested real talent and the judgment to use it well. This coterie is the first group Galen has trained since Chivalry and I were boys, and I do not find them well taught. No, they are trained as monkeys and parrots are taught to mimic men with no understanding of what they do, but they are what I have. Galen has no finesse. He is as coarse as his mother was, and just as presumptuous. He paused suddenly, and his cheeks flushed as if he had said something ill-considered, which he does. (laughs) Right. Um, He was trying to skirt around the fact that Galen was a bastard himself, and Queen Desire's son, and he just kind of mentions that he was as presumptuous as his mother, which was his stepmother as well. <laughs> yes. And also as coarse, which <laughs> is pretty great. Glad to know that we're all on the same page about how terrible his mother and half stepbrother are. So Yeah. Or I guess it wouldn't be half. It would just be full stepbrother. Um, because half- there's no blood relation. It, it wouldn't. He's not even. Uh, yeah, I guess so. A step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Half brothers regal, but yeah, coteries and skill masters are a unit to help the king mm-hmm. or the royal family skill, and these people are not. Yep. <laughs> and Verity's like, I, I can only use them as messenger birds because that's what they are. Yeah, like, they have no it. concept of what to do with the skill. Yep. Skill is like a language, boy. I need not shout at you to let you know what I want. I can ask politely, or hint, or let you know my wish with a nod and a smile. And that just goes to show that, like, you know, Galen has no finesse. He literally just commands Fitz, die. Yep. And that was his command. And then he misted him to, like, make him believe that he wasn't good at it. And those were, like, the two things that he could only do, really. And it works until Verity finds it. 
All of that eludes Galen, both in the use of the skill and the teaching of it. He uses force to batter his way in. Privation and pain are one way to lower man's defenses. It is the only way Galen believes in. But Solicity used guile. And so it kind of describes like that she would lure him to focus on one thing, and then all of a sudden she would be in his mind congratulating him on being open. Mm -hmm. And he says that um, being open was simply not being closed. And Verity, like offers to teach him the skill, but, like, also he's like, oh, we don't have time, so I can't, actually. Um, were your lessons going well before he tested you? <laughs> and Fitz is like, no, I never had any aptitude. Wait, that's not true. What am I saying? What have I been thinking? And he kind of, like, is reeling back from that, and Verity's like, oh, I was too swift, I suppose, because he's a blunt guy. Like, mm -hmm. he's really, he doesn't really have the tact and conversation to bring it up gradually and make Fitz realize that he was deceived. Um, he says, someone has misted you, befuddled you, much as I do redship navigators and steersmen. Convince them they've taken a sighting already and their course is true, when really they are steering into a cross current. Convince them they've passed a point they haven't sighted yet. Someone convinced you that you could not scale. Galen, I spoke with certainty. And Verity's like, yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, um, though if you skilled into him, I'm sure you would have seen what chivalry did to him. He hated your father with a passion prior to Shiv turning him into a lapdog. Which, why did he hate chivalry? Is it the same, is it Queen Desire again? Like, it has to be, right? Saying, like, oh, you have, even though you're, you know, not truly born of, like, the true royal line, like, you have more royal blood than chivalry and verity. Probably. The or, same thing she did the regal? Yeah. I mean, probably. You deserve their spot more than they do. It's chivalry's fault my regal won't be king. Yeah. But, um, Shiv turned him into a lapdog. They felt bad about it, but, uh, and they would have undone it if they figured out how and escape Solicity's notice. So... <laughs> Um, they were boys, they made a mistake, and they didn't own up to it, and now that hate is kind of transferred on to Fitz. Which goes to question why they didn't fix it once she had died. They could have done it then. Yeah, they could have. And they just decided, eh, it'll, it'll be okay. <laughs> but we learned that Chivalry did this over something Galen had done to Verity. Yeah. So it wasn't even in defense of himself or because he had said something mean to chivalry. Mm -hmm. It was in defense of very, which is very chivalrous, <laughs> but also kind of speaks to how nice of a person Fitz's dad was. And um, he kind of explains that how chivalry is with the skill and how he was angry when he was doing it. But even when he wasn't angry, it was like being trampled by a horse or ducked in a fast flowing river. Um, he'd get in a hurry and barge into you and dump his information and flee. I guess I've always assumed you knew all this. Though I'm damned if there's any way you could have. Who would have told you? And Fitz seizes on pretty much just one piece of information there. Uh, you could teach me this skill? And Verity's like, if we had the time, a great deal of time. You're a lot like Shiv and I were when we learned. Erratic, strong, but with no idea how to bring that strength to bear. And Galen has, well, scarred you, I suppose. You've walls I can't begin to penetrate, and I am strong. You'd have to learn to drop them. That's a hard thing, but I could teach you, yes, if you and I had a year and nothing else to do. But we don't. And Fitz is like, my hopes, my hopes crashed again, and there's, you know, a ton of disappointment crashing on him because he thinks that going out for this test all of Galen's months and everything were for nothing. Smithy died. He lost Beric. All of this happened, and he didn't get anything from it. And just all of that emotion kind of crashes on him again. And he also realizes that Galen had tried to kill me just as surely as if he'd had a knife. And no one have known of how he'd beat me save his loyal coterie. And while he failed at that, he had taken from me the chance to learn skilling. He'd crippled me, and I would... I leaped to my feet, furious. 
And this is where uh, Verity's like, you have a grievance, I know that, but we can't have Discord in the keep right now. He is part of, like, what we need to do to protect the kingdom. Mm-hmm. So you can't really do anything right now. Um, carry it with you quietly for the king's sake. Carry it with you until you can settle it quietly. Yeah, okay, there. That's a pretty distinct difference. Yes, right <laughs> not just, oh, just be quiet about your hate. No, no, no. If you can settle it quietly, I'll look the other way. <laughs> but he's he's saying, like, why would you want this anyway? It's miserable, and it's not an ocu- a fit occupation for a man. Because Verity would much rather be leading troops somewhere. He'd much mm-hmm. rather be building his warships. He'd much rather be on the warships fighting. Yeah. And but he's the only one who can do this. So. And then Fitz learns a truth about himself by answering... To help you, I said without thinking, and then I found it true. Once it would have been to prove myself true, a true and fit son to chivalry, to impress Burek or Jade, to increase my standing in the keep. Now, after watching what Verity did day after day with no praise or acknowledgement from his subjects, I found I only wanted to help him. To help me, he repeated. With exhausted resignation, he lifted his eyes to the window. Take the food away, boy. I have no time for it now. And Fitz is like, I'd give you my strength, Verity, if I could. And Verity looked at him really oddly. Are you sure? Very sure? And he says, of course I would. I am a king's man. And... Then Verity whispers, There is just time, he whispered, and it might be enough. Damnation to you, father. Must you always win? Come here then, boy. And then Fitz wakes up later. Yeah. Because he passed out. But Verity looks better. (laughs) Yeah, Verity is, you know, regained energy in a way that Fitz hasn't seen him before. For a long time, at least. And... He grinned at me, an old, fierce grin that faded slowly as he looked down on me. Like a calf to slaughter, he said ruefully, I should have known that you didn't know what you were talking about. What happened to me, I managed to ask. You offered me your strength. I took it. Go slowly. I was in a hurry. As he's, like, holding a cup to his mouth for Fitz to drink tea, because he's completely out of it right now. And... He then continues like this explanation that in the old days, a king would draw on his coterie, half a dozen men or more, and all in tune with one another, able to pool strength and offer it as needed. That was their true purpose, to provide strength to their king, or to their own key man. I don't think Galen quite grasps that. His coterie is a thing that he has fashioned. They are like horses and bullocks and donkeys, all harnessed together. Not a true coterie at all. They lack the singleness of mind. And he mentions that Fitz said the old words, basically, like, draw strength on me, I am a king's man, was, like, the key old word of, like, I know what I'm doing, like, draw strength from me, Uh (laughs) skill-wise. So, um, and him being of the same blood, Verity knew he could do it pretty easily. And he's like, well, Shrewd set things in motion, and it was no accident you're the one to bring me my meals. He was making you available to me. It will not happen again. Because he doesn't want that. He didn't want to draw strength from Fitz. He wanted the strength. He wanted to be able to skill. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't think it's a fit man for anybody. He doesn't want to do that to anybody. He doesn't want to drain anybody of strength. Right. He says he could have killed Fitz if he hadn't noticed. Mm -hmm. He says then, I'll not drain you like this. Not for anyone. Here. Not even for the kingdom. Like he... I think Shrewd would make that decision in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. It's power, and he needs it to protect yeah. the greater good. But Verity... It's I mean, protecting the person, too. Yeah. Because, I mean, they've kind of gotten close. I, not that I think Verity would have done it had he barely known Fitz. Right. But maybe it's also a little bit because he looks like his brother. <laughs> and he wouldn't... I don't think chivalry would have done that to him. And vice versa. And so seeing the likeness of his brother and his nephew and saying, no, I'm not your family and I'm not doing that is just really nice. Yeah. And then, um, 
he's dismissed. He's like, say I was a distraction, have a kitchen boy come up. Like, I'm not going to have you around as that temptation. Um, and Fitz is like, Verity, I began. No, he corrected me. Say my prince. For in this, I am your prince, and I will not be questioned on it. Now eat. I bowed my head, miserable, but I did eat, and the elf bark and the tea worked to revive me faster than I had expected. Soon I could stand, to stack the dishes on the tray, and then carry them to the door. I felt defeated. I lifted the latch. Fit chivalry farseer. I halted, frozen by the words. I turned slowly. It's your name, boy. I wrote it myself, in the military log, on the day you were brought to me. Another thing I had thought you knew. Stop thinking of yourself as the bastard, Fitz Chivalry Farseer. Goodbye, I said quietly, but he was already staring out the window again. He learned his name. I mean, he knew his name. No, he didn't. He thought of himself as boy or the bastard or just the Fitz. And he thought that the reason that Birk was calling him Fitz was because he was straightforward and everything. But it's Fitz Chivalry Farseer. It's an actual name that was written down that was given to him. I guess. That's what he's been hoping for his whole life. It's a big moment for him. And it's something that is on his mind all the time because Verity was in his mind briefly. And we know it takes a while to sort through memories and stuff. So that thought of... I am the bastard must be in his mind at the forefront of it. Well, I mean, that is basically what he was saying before Fitz or before Verity went through his mind. He yeah, was saying that's true. I've it's... heard said the bastards because that was yeah. what the die command had brought true. towards him. The shame of being a bastard. Yeah. So But he gets that little that little something else, which I think is a great moment. And so uh, it goes to where Fitz is invited to a breakfast with Verity and King Shrewd. And he doesn't really know why he's there. Um, and he kind of like... They're talking about the wedding because we had that rumor from Molly the last time that Verity was to wed. So obviously Verity doesn't want to. And Shrewd's like, well, you have to. And Fitz kind of interjects here and he's like, I hunted with Leon two days ago took a rabbit for me and Verity's kind of happy for the distraction smiles like almost like old Verity and he's like you took my wolfhound out for rabbits <laughs> um and Fitz is you know singing his praises like oh he enjoys it but he misses you didn't really seem to satisfy him that I was the one there mm -hmm. I couldn't tell him how the hound had looked at me not for you as plain in his eyes as in his bearing so they have like a little connection there that Fitz is sad to see Leon well actually Leon is sadder he's <laughs> he's more uh, sad that Verity isn't there than Fitz is to have something to take care of right but Trude is kind of getting annoyed with that and cuts in he's like we need to stick to topic this wedding will hearten people um, they're kind of terrified they don't see an end to their troubles and we can't promise them solutions that we don't have. Right. We're a settled people now. The out islanders can destroy our towns and really strike fear into who we are as a society. Mm -hmm. So we need to show people that if you marry and have a kid, things, things are going to be fine right. in the future. When settled people look for security, they look for continuity. Yeah. And Fitz looks up at that and he's like, those were Chade's words. I'd bet my blood on it. So Shrewd and Chade have obviously agreed on this and i'm sure this is a um you know a little bit rehearsed throughout mm -hmm. this oh yeah um but also now he's like hmm so chade has an interest in this i wonder why yeah what's going on <laughs> i mean yeah but chade does have an interest in securing the kingdom in general too along with yes. shrewd um but yeah it, it kind of sounds like oh they have a hand in this, so obviously they have some lines memorized, and he's kind of confirmed this next paragraph where 
Shrewd's like, it's a matter of reassuring our folk, Verity. You have not Regal's charm, nor the bearing that let chivalry convince anyone that he could take care of any matter. This is not to slight you. You have as much talent for the skill as I have ever seen in our line, and in many eras your soldierly skills in tactics would have been more important than chivalry's diplomacy. This sounded suspiciously like a rehearsed speech to me. So those two, like, alternating paragraphs there is just like, okay, Jade and Trude have workshopped this little yeah. talk. But also, it's a little rough to tell your kid, like, my other two sons are better at being royals than you are. 100%. So the only thing you can do is get married. <laughs> yeah. And Verity, he understands that. And later we see a conversation where they've had a, you know, an argument before with Shrewd, between Shrewd and Verity, and he knows that he was raised to be the second son and stand behind the throne, and it it's kind of an underlying thing, and it's not great to, you know, air that out in front of you to bash it in if you already know it, so. Right. Um, Verity is extremely exhausted. He's, you know, he's just kind of, like, sitting there trying to stay awake while Shrewd says this rehearsed speech to him, and... Um, he kind of shortens, I'm guessing he shortens it, because he's like, okay, putting it simply, you need to marry, and you need to have a child. And Verity is like, you and I would know better, though. We're not, like, saving the kingdom by me marrying and having a child. You and I both know that we're on the brink of disaster. And now, right now, there can be no slackening of our vigilance. I have no time for court courting and wooing, and even less time for the more subtle negotiations of finding a royal bride. While the weather is fine, the red ships will raid. And then he goes on to discuss that when it turns poor, he wants to be building warships. He wants to be able to train and, and build these warships and be able to maybe help fight in the spring, and by next winter, maybe even bring the fight to the out islands. Yeah. And he's animated during this talk. He, he really has been thinking about this, and he wants this to happen. And Shrewd's like, well, that's going to cost money. And we don't get money from people who are terrified and, and won't do their jobs, so they have no money to pay taxes. You have to marry to, you know, get these people to understand that there is a future for the kingdom. Right. And Verity kind of collapses. He's like, fun, like, whatever, I guess. As you will, my king, I will do as you see wise. Such is the duty of a prince to his king and to his kingdom. But as a man, father, it is a bitter and empty thing, this taking of a woman selected by my younger brother. I will wager that having looked on Regal first, when she stands beside me, she will not see me as any great prize. Verity looked down at his hands, at the battle and work scars that now showed plainly against their paleness and he's he's really feeling in his heart like pride his pride taking a hit at this like he doesn't want to marry this way he wants to be out battling he doesn't want to be a tool right for the kingdom well, it's, but he understands. It's kind of like a couple chapters ago when Fitz was talking to Molly about Regal picking out the wife for Verity. Yeah. Regal is so different. And I'm sure Verity knows just as well as Fitz the type of girls that flock to Regal. And while they're all pretty, and I'm sure that would be fun to have a pretty bride... He knows that that type of woman will never be satisfied with him after spending time with Regal. And right. that's probably why he's so upset. Just one of the reasons, yeah. yeah. And he says softly, Always I have been your second son, behind chivalry with his beauty, strength, and wisdom, and now behind Regal with his cleverness and charm and airs. I know you think he would be a better king to follow after you than I. I do not always disagree with you. I was born second, and raised to be second. I had always believed that my place would be behind the throne, not upon it. And when I thought that chivalry would follow you to that high seat, I did not mind it. He gave me great worth, my brother did. 
His confidence in me was like an honor. It made me a part of all he accomplished. To be the right hand of such a king were better than to be king of many a lesser land. I believed in him as he believed in me, but he is gone. And I tell you nothing is nothing surprising when I say to you that there is no such bond between Regal and me. Perhaps too many years, perhaps Chivalry and I were so close we left no room for a third. I do not think he sought for a woman that can love me, or one that... And Trude is kind of angry that this whole conversation is being brought out in front of Fitz. Right. And it's probably a conversation that they've had a couple times. And Shrewd's like, he chose you a queen for the kingdom. Not a woman, not for you, not for himself, not for any such silliness. He chose a queen. And Regal kind of struck gold, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it was just happenstance? No, I think Regal actually chose extremely well on purpose because the mountain kingdom is the closest to the the six duchies and as we see at the end of the chapter he kind of has a plan for making it the seven duchies with the mountain kingdom right and he wants to take over for the six duchies he wants to get shrewd out of the way he wants to get very out of the way he's wooing ketrakin later on in the books and wants to win her over to his side so when all of the mountain kingdom royal family is out of the way and all of his family is out of the way he can rule the seven duchies together they have good products out there that the six duchies need right and they have wealth that they can bring in but also it's not chelsea who's views women as worthless so if you marry one of their you know high (laughs) royal families you're not getting anything right you're not going to marry into the Out Islanders because they're at war with you right now. Exactly. So the Mountain Kingdom's like the only choice that kind of works. True. Because Bingtown doesn't really have a royal family, and you're not going to go as far south as Jamalia or anything like that. So. True. Hmm. I think like it was the best choice. Plus, it like fits into his plans for the future of <laughs> getting more power. That's fair. But either way. King Shrewd is mad, um, and he says, You must set aside this jealousy of your brother. You cannot fend off the enemy if you do not have confidence in those who stand behind you. Exactly, Verity said quietly. He pushed his chair back. Where do you go? Shrewd demanded irritably. To my duties, Verity said shortly. Where else have I to go? And this is when Shrewd... Even Shrewd looks taken aback here. Yeah, he's, he's like, like, well, you haven't eaten. You've barely eaten anything. And, and Ver- Verity, yeah, Verity's like, you know, the skill kills all the all the other appetites. You know that. And Shrewd's like, well, you know that's when a man is close to the edge. Because mm-hmm. the appetite for the skill devours and does not sustain or nourish a man. And Verity kind of continues... But what does the devouring of one man matter if it saves a kingdom? He did not bother to disguise the bitterness in his voice, and to me it was plain that it was not the skill alone that he spoke of. After all, he said with sarcasm, it is not as if you do not have yet another son to step in and wear your crown, one unscarred by what the skill does to men, one free to wed where he will or will not. And this passage kind of sounds like sacrifice. This is mm-hmm. what the Mountain Kingdom believes is the role of their royalty. Um, Ketrikin doesn't do things because she wants to do them. She does it because it's her duty to be the sacrifice for the people. And in the same way, Verity isn't using the skill to protect everyone because he wants to do things this way. It's because he has to. This is the only way to protect the kingdom. And So, in a way, that makes them an even better match because they both understand. And I think this sets up Ketrikin to be a better wife for him. Perfect match, pretty much. Yeah. Shrewd gets defensive, and he's like, well, Regal, it's not his fault that he was unskilled. He was a really sickly child. Galen couldn't train him. Um, And then he says the really heartbreaking line. Yeah. And who could have foreseen that two skilled princes would not have been enough? He rose abruptly and paced the length of the chamber. 
I do what I can, son. Do you think I do not care that I do not see how you are being consumed? Shrewd has basically lost two of his sons. Yeah. Or is in the process of losing his second to the skill and defense. Like, yeah. That he mandated. Uh huh. And he probably has an inkling that his wife killed his son. Yeah. Like. And on top of that, he didn't make Galen skill train anyone before this. Yeah. And he has to know as well as Verity that what Galen did with the skill isn't enough. Like, right. that's not anything. That's not useful at all. And so now when they need it most, because he didn't give him a trial run, there's nothing to do about it because that's what they have. And he has to be beating himself up. Oh, yeah. I mean, he cares about his son. Like, it's still a father and a son, even though the king side of Shrewd comes out more often. Right. And we know, like, the fool loves King Shrewd, and he's a great judge of character. So we know they're both, like, good people. It's just we see the shrewd part of King Shrewd. Mm-hmm. And Verity's like, no, I, I know you care for me. It's the weariness of the skill that makes me say so. And... He knows that he's the only one that can really help because Shrewd has to keep a clear mind. Someone has to keep a clear mind to rule the kingdom and make decisions. And the skill does not allow for that. It's just that he lashes out because things are out of his control and he's trying his best and he doesn't like it. He says, you know, I've never relished this father. It never seemed to me worthy of a warrior to skulk and spy about in men's minds. He'd rather be on his ships fighting or or just face-to-face with somebody fighting to fix issues. And True doesn't really understand that. Yeah. Well, he says, I'd rather unman a man with a blade than turn the hounds of his own mind to nipping at his heels. Yeah. I really like that phrase. Robin Hobb is great imagery again. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But Fitz feels guilty here because um, he says... Deeper within me was the sneaking guilt that I had failed to learn the skill and was of no use to my uncle at this time. It just comes up again that he wants him to use his strength again. Like, even though he was scared of that happening, the same thing happening to him, Fitz is like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I don't care how scary it is. It's worth it to help Verity. Verity only looks at him and is like, take care of my dog for me. Um, You know, I hate to leave him in his rooms each day, but he's a distraction from what I must do. And Fitz is surprised here because he says uh, he felt emanating from him a shadow of the same pain that Fitz had felt at being separated from his own dogs. Right. And so this kind of begs the question, what really is the wit deep down? Yeah. I mean, if Verity has a sort of bond with Leon, because we know... Leon definitely seems like he wants to be bonded with Verity. Yeah, or he has uh, just, like, this, a, a center of self to be able to be bonded. Right. And Verity sort of has a, a similar feel that way. It's just really interesting because then is the wit just something natural that Fitz just happens to be able to see? Mm-hmm. Or is it really... I mean, it is definitely more than just what's naturally there in the world because you can communicate with animals but right. like i don't know i just think it's really interesting to think about the fact that even non-witted people have elements of the wit in them yeah and which is like kind of what connects everybody together and what freaks mm-hmm. fits out about the forged ones so much and the fool right. so um then shrewd's like oh i almost forgot to tell you uh the mountain princess's name is Ketkin or something like that. And Verity's like, Ketrikin, I at least remember that much. So that's who you chose for me. And then Shrewd's like, yep, for all the reasons we discussed. And here's the date of the wedding. It's already been set. And Verity is pretty mad and frustrated at this. Regal's the one who chose the, the date. Yeah, it's ten days before our harvest feast. Yeah. 
but that's still not winter yet. So Verity is extremely frustrated because he has to skill. That's He says it's like uh, the greediest and most reckless the Islanders are um, in the year because it's the final month before winter storms drive them back. So he has to be skilling this whole time, and, and he can't. Yeah, and he asks, do, do you think this will be any different this year? Yeah. Like as not, I would bring Ketrickin back here to find them feasting in our own buck keep with your head on a pike to greet me. And King Shrewd's like, do you really think they could press us that greatly if you gave your efforts of 20 days, like, a rest? And Verity's like, I, I know it. I know that would happen. That's why he's, like, running himself ragged. Yeah. Because he knows that there's a lot of ships out there that it would be a lot worse. Well, it, a lot worse. It says a lot because they're still attacking. They're still forging people. There's yeah. still horrible attacks going on. And that's with Verity guarding the coastline with his mind and all the soldiers. So how much worse is it going to be at the worst time of the year without any protection at all. Right. And, um, Shrewd's like, oh, like, we can't change the dates, really. They have their own beliefs there. You either have to have a wedding in the fall or the late spring. And those are both times that they're going to be raiding. Yep. And Regal, of course, is the one who set these dates, and I, I don't, I really don't think there's anything... Like, misinformation, because I think yeah. Shrewd has spent time in the Mountain Kingdom. He's learned everything like that, but right. it's but a I also terrible think, coincidence. Yeah. I don't know. Regal did pick the date, and so I feel like he could have done one closer to the end of fall or something. I mean, like, I know this is close, but I don't know. He could have picked a different date, is all I'm saying. And for all we know, the, like, idea that the Baron in the Winter marriage thing is just something he made up. <laughs> I don't trust Regal at all, if you can't tell. <laughs> I mean, I don't like defending Regal, but, like, he might not have picked the date. He might have been like, this is, like, we have to do it by custom. Because I, I really think that Shrewd does know. I think it's mentioned later in the chapter that um, Shrewd spent time among the monk mountain folk, so I feel like he would know some of their customs, too. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't like Regal, so. True. Neither do I. I don't, I don't know if... If you would like him, I'd be kind of concerned. <laughs> you did say he was, you pictured him as really handsome before. Well, so. handsome people can be awful. <laughs> you don't have to be ugly to be awful. True. Most of the time, pretty people are pretty bad. So, I mean, not all of them, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but Verity's like, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, Strude's like, well, it'll be good. You just need a vacation. That's what you need. Yeah. And Verity is very mad at this, and he gets more mad than Fitz has ever seen him. Yeah, he's he just says, like, no. no. No, no, and no. I cannot do the work I must do to keep the raiders from our coast while being rocked and jolted in a horse litter. And no, I will not go to this bride you have chosen for me, to this woman I scarce recall, in a litter like an invalid or a whitling. I will not have her see me so. Nor would I have my men sniggering behind me, saying, Oh, this is what brave Verity has come to, riding like a palsied old man, pandered off to some woman as if you were an out-islander whore. Where are your wits that you can think such stupid plans? You've been among the mountain folk, you know their ways. Think you a woman of theirs would accept a man who came to her in such a sickly way? Even their royals expose a child if it is born less than whole. You'd spoil your own plan and leave the six duchies to the raiders while you did it. Which is such a valid point. Yeah. He has his pride in in mind here as well. Like, he doesn't want his men to see him like this. He right. knows what this does to him. He doesn't have... He doesn't take pride in what he does to protect the, the kingdom because he doesn't like the skill. He but doesn't he... want to be appear sickly to Ketrickin. Yeah. Well, he knows about the rumors going around that he's just... Yeah drinking himself silly and he knows they're not true but still he knows that's how people are looking at him and he doesn't want the men that once respected him to look down on him right and that's fair and he cuts off shrewd and continues on like you're 
doing this, you're going to undo, like, everything I did last night. Like, this standing yeah. here is just going to undo all of the ships that I befuddled. Yeah. What will 20 days do? Exactly. And specifically, he says, Already all the work I did last night while you slept and Regal danced and drank with his courtiers is coming undone. Yeah. Like, it's... He's... He knows that Regal isn't really doing much. Yep. And he understands why Shrewd has to sleep and stuff, but at the same time, Verity is the one who's staying up and protecting everything. Yeah. Regal's out partying, and that's fine with you, but I'm dying protecting this country, and it's gonna be for nothing if you make me go. And I'm sure Verity is also frustrated with the lack of commitment either way that Shrewd has with proclamations, with defense, anything. Right. So... It's, yeah, it's not a great time to bring up weddings. No. But at the same time, like, the kingdom does kind of need it. Like, they're right. Like, Shrewd and Verity both have valid points. Right. Well, yeah, because you can't convince these people who have been paying extra taxes for extra defense, and that's not working, obviously. People are still getting hurt but they still have to pay for these guards at the coasts and then tell them, hey, we're going to raise taxes again because we're going to build ships and this and that extra layer of defense will for sure help because the extra they're paying right now isn't helping. So how are you going to convince them that raising taxes on these people who don't have anything because they're too scared to work their trade is going to work unless you have... The prince marrying. And so, proving and having a kid. Uh-huh. To and, prove that things aren't so bad. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. And Trude is exhausted with this conversation after, after Verity leaves and kind of looks at Fitz and he's like, oh, why are you here? Oh, yeah. Well, that went well, didn't it? Still in all, a way must be found. And when Verity rides to claim his bride, you will go with him. And then he continues on with this little little talk with Fitz and says, The princess has a single sibling, an older brother, Rurisk, as we know. Um, he is not a healthy man, which is false, as we know. <laughs> he was well and strong once, but on the ice fields he took an arrow through his chest. Passed clean through him, so Regal was told, and the wounds on his chest and back healed. But in winters he coughs blood, and in summer he cannot sit a horse nor drill his men for more than half the morning. Knowing the mountain folk, it is full surprising that he is their king in waiting. I thought quietly for a moment. Among the mountain folk, the custom is the same as ours. Male or female, the offspring inherit by the order of their birth. Yes, that is so, Shrewd said quietly, and I knew that already he was thinking that seven duchies might be stronger than six. So here we have Shrewd setting up that Rurisk will inherit, but we're marrying the younger sibling. But if that, just like if chivalry passes away, it goes to Verity. If Rurisk passes away, it mm -hmm. goes to Ketrikin. So if Rurisk is taken care of, Ketrikin is in line to the throne, and we can subsume that mountain kingdom into a seventh duchy. Right. Except this is all based off of information Regal gave the king, so... Yeah. We know Rurisk is very intelligent, he's strong and healthy, and he is very smart about politically what's happening. Right. And Regal doesn't help that by saying that Fitz is the poisoner mm -hmm. to everybody. But um, he then Fitz continues on and asks, and Ketrikin's father, how is his health? knowing that if the king was out of the way, then it would go to Rurisk first. But as of right now, he's as hale and hearty as one could wish for a man of his years. I am sure he will reign long and well for at least another decade, keeping his kingdom whole and safe for his heir. Not for Rurisk or the older brother, for his heir. Mm -hmm. um, and Fitz is like, probably by then our troubles with the red ships will long be over. Verity will be free to turn his mind to other things. Probably, King Shrewd agreed quietly. His eyes finally met mine. 
When Verdi goes to claim his bride, you will go with him, he said again. You understand what your duties will be? I trust to your discretion. As you wish, my king. So obviously the plan that Regal has put forward, which is good for the kingdom as a whole, right. even if it's you know kind of despicable and based off bad information, is that if you get Rurisk out of the way, Ketrikin will become queen of the Mountain Kingdom in a decade or two when the six duchies have stabilized and mm-hmm. this war with this, the raiders is over. And then it will go to the ruler of um, the six duchies because they're one family now. Right. So why not rule them together? But what I don't understand is, I mean, whenever we meet Ketrikin and Verisk, they're super close. They love each other. Why would it, why wouldn't you just let him be alive? He'll obviously still have a good connection with his sister and like be agreeable in trade in the future. Like probably economics, like taxes and things like that. I guess. Yeah. You don't have to trade if it's yours. That's true. (laughs) I got, and you can tax the people. Okay, sure. But I don't know. It just seems awful. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, but the, uh, the, I trust to your discretion is an interesting line here because we know it, Fitz's discretion comes into his training and Chade's training and everything like that. He's he's usually told, go this way, assess this situation, and deal with it as best as possible. Um, and usually that's, like, the main directive. But for Nipe, like, that was a good thing that he didn't have to kill right. the duke there. He just, you know, convinced the... The wife. The wife to get rid of her jewels to save whatever was going on there. But his discretion when he gets to the Mountain Kingdom is that, one, I'm compromised because Regal's told everybody I'm the poisoner and they know. Mm -hmm. Two, Regal is asking me why I haven't killed him, why I haven't poisoned him, what, like, what's going on with this, and is pushing so hard and inserting himself so much into this that it's suspicious for a 15-year-old boy. Right. Like, <laughs> and that's the worst part is like if Regal just would have butted out, it would have been fine probably. So as smart as Regal is, you'd think he would realize. But Fitz would have chosen not to kill Rurisk, which is really what Regal wants. I guess, yeah. So it's, I don't know. Yeah, but it, yeah, I guess like if he had just not told everybody he was a poisoner and Well, no, I understand why he did that because regardless of if Fitz would have killed him, his ru- his reputation is ruined and maybe somebody would have been mad enough to kill him. Right. Which is his ultimate goal is to get rid of Fitz. I get that. What I don't understand is him going up to Fitz and be like, well, "Why haven't you killed him yet?" while also at the same time obviously trying to sabotage Fitz. Right. Like, obviously you're doing something shady, and now I'm not going to do what you say, you dumb idiot. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just, it feels like a bad move on his part, That's but I guess I it think, works like, out. Queen Desire was, like, the real brains behind the operation. <laughs> Fair enough. Like, Regal has a brain enough yeah. on most things, and he can get by, but he sometimes he just it makes... With smoke. True. And he makes the worst decisions sometimes. Besides the fact that his decisions are all usually awful. Right. I just mean, like, even from a villain standpoint. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like bad, bad luck, I guess. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting place we leave off. I'm excited to see how it plays out. We know, We know in the future how it does, but, like, I'm interested to dive into the decisions of, like why the king says, no, follow through with what Regal says, Mm -hmm. like when he skills back to him and and things like that. And why Jade doesn't know that the king has told Fitz to do this. Yeah, I think next chapter, like, Fitz kind of mentions casually, and Jade's like, excuse me, what? (laughs) (laughs) Because it's Regal's plan. Yeah, and the king doesn't want Jade to tell him no. I mean, not that Jade really has the power to say no to the king, but they're close enough in age, and he, Jade's 
his advisor, he's going to point out the flaws and ask for more information besides one source. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, thank you for listening to us this week. Um, interested to get into chapter 19. This one is pre-recorded, so if you send anything um, for us from chapter 17, um, we'll probably get to it next week. But uh, just to let you guys know that it will take a little bit for us to answer some of those. Yeah, so this week we don't have a little chatty corner to talk about your emails, yeah. but... <laughs> We probably read them if you sent them. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for the support um, on all the platforms and everything like that. We really appreciate it. Yeah.